The Coming Tribulation, A History of the Apocalypse Part 5 Armageddon and the Second Advent Revelation 16, 1 through 1921 By Dr. Robert D. Luganbill Introduction From the point of view of believers, the overarching event of the Tribulation's second half has been the great persecution and the martyrdom it has entailed as our adversary, the devil through his son, the beast has been attempting to eliminate faith and the faithful from the earth entirely. Had this evil process and the regime of Antichrist been allowed to continue uninterrupted for much longer, not only would it have meant an end to the remnant of faith upon the earth, but it is also the case that no flesh would have survived. It is precisely for the sake of the elect that our Lord has shortened the days, Mark 13.20. Beginning with the bold judgments in the tribulation's final year, God's direct and powerful intervention into human events will complicate Satan and the beast's control of the world, leading inexorably and ineluctably to our Lord Jesus Christ's return in judgment and glory at Armageddon, and granting believers a measure of respite in the process. For those who have survived until this point, the message is clear. Be strong. Don't be afraid. Behold, your God will come as an avenger. Your God will come as a rewarder. He will come and he will deliver you. Isaiah 35, 4. And there will be signs in the sun and the moon and the stars, and on the earth there will be great distress among the nations, who will be greatly bewildered by the roaring of the sea and its massive waves, and men will lose heart out of fear and expectation of what is about to come upon the inhabited world. For the luminaries of the heavens will be powerfully shaken. And then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and much glory. When these things begin to happen, stand up and raise up your heads because your redemption is near. Then he told them a parable. Look at the fig tree and all its leaves. When they have already come out like this, you can see for yourselves by examining it that summer is near. So also when you see that all things have come to pass, know that the kingdom of God is near. Luke 21, 25 through 31 the Bold Judgments, Revelation 16, 1 through 21. As to the precise placement of the Bold Judgments in the chronology of the Great Tribulation, Scripture provides a number of clues which give us the ability to project a plausible timeline for their occurrence. As is made clear throughout chapter 16, the exact terminus for the Bold Judgments is Armageddon and the Second Advent, see Revelation 16, 16 and 17, since both of these events and the build-up to them are part and parcel of bowls 6 and 7. Further, the start point for these seven judgments must occur at some point during the tribulation's final three and a half years, obviously in that, along with everything else which follows Revelation 11:15 through 19 and precedes Christ's return in chapter 19, they are part of the seventh trumpet, which represents the great tribulation. So although there is clearly a relationship, and many obvious parallels, between the seven judgments of warning and the seven judgments of punishment, at first glance it may seem impossible for the bowls to parallel the trumpets in terms of raw time, since the total number of months of warning comprised by the trumpet judgments is 63 when the 42 months of the seventh trumpet, the Great Tribulation, are included in the count. On the other hand, the boundaries provided by the start and stop points of the Great Tribulation can provide us with only 42 months at most. In actuality, of course, the linear total has to be far fewer than 42, since a good deal of time must be allowed at the beginning of the Great Tribulation for the Great Persecution, for it is to this offence that the bowls constitute a divine response. Compare Revelation 16, 5 through 7. The correct solution lies in positing an overlap in the effects of the bowl judgments, that is, a continuation of the effects of each judgment, even as the next in sequence begins, with the effects of all seven continuing until Christ's return. In this way it is possible to telescope these seven in a manner that will both yield a total of 63 total, partially overlapping, months of judgment parallel to the 63 sequential months of warning represented by the trumpet judgments, while at the same time allowing the bold judgments to fit into the Great Tribulation's second half in a reasonable and workable way with the rising crescendo of punishment designed to be unbearable, 
in contrast to the sequential and relatively endurable hardships of the warning judgments. Bowl 6 and 7, which comprise the entire Armageddon campaign along with all of the other events which precede the Second Advent, form the anchor for this system. Since, as we have already seen, Armageddon and our Lord's return occur in the fall, as symbolized by the Day of Atonement, and since the events of Bowls 6 and 7 will almost certainly require the bulk of the preceding summer and spring, the summoning and transporting of the beast's armies to Israel from throughout the world being a particularly time-consuming logistical task, the positing of six and seven months for the seventh and six bowl judgments respectively fits the evidence. This schema also has in its favor the fact that the supplying of a further month for each additional bowl judgment, working backward, that is, totals of six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, and finally twelve months for each bowl judgment from the seventh to the first respectively, yields the desired total of sixty-three months reckoned in overlapping total, yet manages to do so in only twelve months of overall linear chronological time. This modelling of the likely chronology of the bowl judgments also has in its favour that it allows for the fact that just as the seven trumpets constituted a build-up to the Great Tribulation, so the seven bowls constitute a rising crescendo of judgment in anticipation of the return of our Lord and his judgment of the beast, the devil, and all their minions at the Battle of Armageddon. It allows for the fact that, inasmuch as these judgments are in no small part the divine response to the great persecution, chapters 14 and 15 plus 16, 5 through 7, sufficient time must first pass for that persecution to take place before the bold judgments begin, and as we have seen the persecution is allowed to take its course for quite some time. It allows for the bold judgments to fit into the gap between the great persecution and Armageddon, and it is difficult to see how this could extend much past the suggested chronology of the tribulation's final year. It allows for the time required for all of the armies of the world to gather for Armageddon, the subject of the fifth and sixth bold judgments, with this assembly taking place during the spring and summer of the final tribulational year, and with Armageddon itself taking place in the fall, that is, lining up with the Day of Atonement, as well as allowing for sufficient time for the prophesied war between the beast's invading forces and Israel. It allows for sufficient time for the other events which are prophesied to take place in this final year or so, including the plunging of the beast's kingdom into darkness, the event that dislodges him temporarily from Jerusalem, the revolt of Babylon and Israel, the destruction and pillaging of Babylon, and the invasion of Israel preparatory to Armageddon. For the Lord has a day of vengeance, even a year of retribution for Zion's cause. Isaiah 34, 8 Although the overall length of time for this punitive period of judgment is only twelve months from beginning to end, we are not to draw from this fact the notion that the bold judgments will, for that reason, be less intense. Quite the contrary. Such an idea is easily refuted by the nature and effect of this second set of judgments, as should be obvious even from a cursory reading of Revelation chapter 16. Moreover, it is also the case that, in contrast to the trumpet judgments which are sequential and non-overlapping, the effects of each bowl judgment continue from their inception right down to the end of the tribulation at the Battle of Armageddon and the second advent of our Lord Jesus Christ. This build-up of blow upon unrelenting blow is characteristic of the pattern of divine punishment where the objects of God's wrath have emphatically and categorically rejected his mercy. Thus the manner in which these final seven judgments are administered reflects their punitive nature, in contrast to the monetary nature of the trumpet judgments. See Revelation 15.1, 15.8, and 16.1.